Sean Hook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Saturday. First elected in 2014, re-elected in 2018, former state treasurer of Arizona, former CEO of Cold Stone Creamery. Governor Doug Ducey, our guest this week on Newsmaker Saturday. Great to see you. Thanks for having me, John. So you win the election. I'm always curious when you don't have to worry about running again. Are you a free man? Are you unencumbered to kind of do your thing? Well, I've always been a free man, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm beholden to the, to, to the voters and the citizens of Arizona. But it is liberating to be reelected and, and be in your second term. And you don't think so much about wh what if, you think about what's possible. Okay, now do, in that vein, does that give you the freedom, for instance, to select Bill Montgomery, the Maricopa County attorney who is now sitting on the Arizona State Supreme Court? To make that pick, probably, you know, you've got a Republican replacing a longtime Democrat. You've really shifted the balance of power on the high court. You've appointed five people in your tenure. It's unprecedented. Is that a, a pick you can make because you don't have to worry about voters saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute here? Well, I would push back on, on much of this. I think okay. much of this has been the, the media narrative. We don't pick we judges. We don't do media narratives. We don't, do we? We don't, we don't <laughs> pick judges as, as Republicans or, or, or Democrats. Judges go on the bench and, and but serve it's all until Republicans now, right? they serve until the end of retirement. No, my first pick was an independent, and my first pick, pick was Clint Bullock who was uh, the, the litigator for the Goldwater That's Institute. Right. That was not a cautious pick. Uh, that was the best possible person for the Supreme Court. I'm very proud of the picks that I've put on the court. Uh, Judge Gould, Judge, Judge Bean, Judge Lopez, and uh, Judge Montgomery. These were the, the best possible available picks presented to me from the commission. But it is ideologically, I mean, you've got a bent going to the right, and it's interesting because I, I think of you kind of as a moderate. Do you think of yourself as a moderate? Well, I think of myself as the governor of all the people. And the people that I look for to put on the bench are people that want to be justices, that don't want to be governor that don't want to be a legislator. I'm looking for people that want to interpret and apply the law. I'll execute and enforce the law. The legislature can write the law. That's what I look for, are strict constructionists, and it crosses party lines. I've, uh, I've appointed more Democrats to the bench. I've appointed more women to the bench than, than my predecessors. Uh, and I'm, I'm proud of e each and every person that I've and elevated. They, they, a lot of folks say this is, this is one of your, going to be one of your lasting legacies, that this could shape that court for 20 years or more. We, we, have, we have seven excellent justices on the court. Uh, the move to expand the number of people on the court, can you explain how that, all the genesis of that? This happened uh, in the first year, a bill from the legislature so that the Supreme Court could hear more cases. Uh, the size of the state had grown dramatically. We punched through 7 million people. And it's an equivalent size uh, government uh, to what you see in, in other states uh, around the country. We were able to pass it through the legislature. In the end, what was it about Bill Montgomery where you said, he's my guy? Well, I want to applaud the commission. They gave me seven excellent candidates, uh, some that I had interviewed uh, more than once. And I'm looking for that in individual who is a, a strict constructionist, someone that understands what textualism and originalism is. Did it bother you he had no bench experience? Well, you know, Samuel Alito, who's on the Supreme Court, was, was a prosecutor before he was elevated to the Supreme Court. Now, he had other experience, but it's the idea of a, a justice is that has to apply judgment on, on the bench, and I'm confident that Bill's judgment will be sound. This week, and I want to I want to show the piece first. You signed the Mitch Warnock Act; it had gone into effect. This is about teen suicide. You've got three boys; two are in college, one still in high school. I sense that this was a very emotional thing. It certainly was for Mr. Warnock, no doubt about it. Let me take you back to this piece. I want, uh, and then we'll talk sure. about it afterwards. Take a look. And with that, Senate Bill 1468, the Mitch Warnock Act, is the law of the land. The Mitch Warnock Act went into effect August 27th, but the ceremonial bill signing today still meant a lot to Mitch's family. Warnock committed suicide in 2016 while he was a student at Corona del Sol in Tempe. His father, Tim, has been fighting for more resources in schools to spot the warning signs ever since. I felt like Mitch was honored. I, I felt like his spirit of wanting to defend 
um, vulnerable kids in some way has come to fruition. A long road led to a unanimous passage in the state legislature this year. The bill requires all schools to train teachers and staff in suicide prevention, an issue pushed hard by Democratic Senator Sean Bowie. It's being implemented at the local level. Uh, I'm visiting a lot of my schools and I'm talking to counselors and I'm talking to principals about social emotional wellness and how important this training is going to be for our teachers and for our support staff. Governor Doug Ducey said that the youth suicide problem in Arizona was enough to call it an epidemic. Kids have to have a uh, safe space where they can th talk to someone where we can remove this stigma of sharing that you're down or depressed or you're considering this type of action. And while there were far too many parents standing around the governor Wednesday who have had to go through tragedy, many were hopeful the bill could reduce the number of parents who have to grieve in the future. Uh, as a father, that had to mean a lot to you. It, it, it meant a lot to get to know uh, Tim Warnock and his wife, Lori, to he hear their story, to understand what a, what a wonderful kid Mitch Warnock was. Great athlete, popular. This is the thing. He had a lot going on, uh, positive things in his life. So raising the awareness, training teachers, removing the stigma, making sure not only parents but, but other uh, adults can, can talk with and with that's kids. what this bill does. Th that's what this bill does. To really does. give teachers training to notice warning signs. Right? And, and we do. We need to remove the stigma around this. We need to have a safe place where people can come and have these conversations. Do you think we're putting too much on teachers? I Well, one, teachers do an incredible job. We've been able to move the 20% pay increase for our teachers. And I don't want to put more on our teachers, but our teachers are already around these students. And mm -hmm. think about it. We need kind more counselors. In a and way. we've brought in more counselors. But teachers have a connection with kids in their classroom. They know them, the kids know them, they know their name. So I think if, uh, if, if a, a teacher is open, which our teachers are, and a kid comes and says, hey, I have a real issue, then you do have that first line of defense. Let's talk about water. January 1, Arizona will see a 7% reduction in Colorado River water, um, the lower basin drought reduction uh, agreement. Now, it's interesting. We're, we're actually, we're going to be, uh, by January, we're going to be 14 feet above the level of the lower basin um, uh, in Lake Mead. We're going to be 14 feet above, but when you hit the trigger point, we're going to be below. How big of a deal will this be to people living in Arizona and farmers? Will we feel it or not? Our citizens won't feel it. Our farmers are going to feel it to a certain degree. Uh, two data points. First, we were able to pass the drought contingency plan, the DCP. We were able to get it out of our legislature, the seven lower basin states. We were the only one that had to do it through legislative action. And thankfully, we had a very wet winter in Arizona last year. So for the foreseeable future, we're in a good place. I mean, we're in the fastest growing city in, in the country, right. in the middle Maricopa of the desert. Maricopa County, the fastest growing yeah. county. We've been very good at water. We've been very responsible. We're going to have to continue to do that. You moved here what year? I moved here in 1982. Yeah, okay, that's about the time. I, I got to ASU a little earlier than you because I'm older than you, I think. But, <laughs> but at any rate, be that as it may, um, I, I always like to ask leaders and politicians, mm -hmm. is there a point, and you're big on economic development, and we're going to get into that, where we have to step back and say, do we want this kind of growth? Is it too much, too much strain on infrastructure, on water, on quality of life? Do you ever sit back sometimes and say, this is getting to be a bit much? Well, I, I do think about this. I think you can have growth. Uh, and responsible growth. The growth that I have promoted has been responsible growth. I think as a, as a company, as a state, uh, you're either growing or, or you're dying. Uh, people vote with their feet. But these we numbers, should take Governor, it, put us really in a tough spot. Well, you know it, puts as well us in, it puts us in a spot where we can get a 20% pay increase to our teachers, where we can move $4.5 billion additional into K-12 education. Rainy Day Fund. Rainy Day Fund. This is because of growth. Think of what happens when there's contraction. People remember the downturn. That was a, a contraction in, in the economy. Those are very tough decisions that you have to make in public policy. Our problems, while we have to plan ahead, these are good ones. And you think why? Water is really issue one when we look at Arizona's future? Is I think education will always be issue one. Water is going to be right alongside it. You have to be responsible and plan ahead for the future, things that outlive your, your uh, time in office. And then, of course, you have infrastructure. Okay, I want to throw something that um, 
We stumbled onto this last night. This was really instructive because of your um, push to try to bring companies here. Do you know of a guy named Trevor Milton? I've heard of Trevor Milton. Okay, well, we happen to interview Trevor Milton about the uh, Nikola Corporation, American hybrid truck design company. They're trying to build uh, a hydrogen, I believe, fuel cell. Yes, it's incredible truck. technology. Okay, so in the middle of this interview, he starts offering up his experience on being courted in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And I think it is instructive to listen to what he has to say. Uh, this is Trevor Milton. Milton. Thank you, Governor. Governor Ducey had called, had called up and said, you need to talk to our team. He said, you really need to come down. You owe it to us. Please come down. And he says, I'll, I'll make sure it's a worthwhile time. Just but at least come down and visit us. We put all this time into this package. I want you to at least look at it. I was like, yes, fair enough. I owe that to you. So we, we came down. And it was absolute red carpet. Um, I've, no other state even came close to what uh, Governor Ducey did when we got here. It was, uh, we got to the dinner table that night, and every business owner that had, that really pertained to us in the entire valley or in the state was there. Every person that, like, he had, he had, you know, the heads of all kinds of trucking companies. He had, he had, everybody was there. And he says, says, you know, when you come to Arizona, I'm not going to give you everything as a government. I'm going to give you everything. I'm going to give you access to every person in the valley that will make your life easier. And he went around and he introduced everyone. And there were all these business leaders inside Arizona that had told me why they moved here, why they liked it. And it was really not about, like, what the government could do for you. It was more about what the community could do for you. <laughs> well, I mean, you might use that in a further campaign ad at some point. That you weren't giving away the store, but you said, we're going to help you. got to come down here. That, that's the opportunity for all agenda in a nutshell. It's opportunity for all, special favors for none. You know, 70% of the people in our state, the adults, were born else they came to Arizona because it's a better place to live now we've got these cutting-edge technology and transportation companies that are looking at every state in the nation and they're selecting Arizona and ASU was a big part of this too right because he what he needed was a workforce ASU, so you brought ASU into the mix ASU and Michael Crow have been a force multiplier for, for the state of Arizona and yes they've been very helpful and it's it's not just Trevor Milton and Nicola it's uh, I think we've got a ribbon cutting tomorrow at Infosys and I think it's on uh, ASU's campus so we, we've got a lot of these success You're doing stories this with many companies we're this doing it with many companies we're doing it with Bobby Robbins in, in southern Arizona and U of A with Rita Chang and Flagstaff what I'm trying to do is show people all the portfolio of assets and positive things that are happening in the state of Arizona and this is one of the results am I over reading it to say that if you if you think you can get them here physically get them here for a meeting you can close them I, I feel pretty uh, good about my closing ability yes <laughs> and it, because I'm selling the state of Arizona I've got a great product I've got great people when you bring people here we use the Phoenix Open the Super Bowl spring sure. training we've all had folks from back home who come to see you here and they're like wow does life look better here we're gonna take a break with Arizona Governor Doug Ducey our guest this week the whole half hour on Newsmaker Saturday back in a moment back on Newsmaker Saturday the full half hour with Arizona Governor Doug Ducey what do you want to do next when this is over? I want to have a very successful session next uh, year when we kick off the State of the State in January. You now, know, John, come I, on. I, I know you're a planner. You're a Boy Scout. I mean, an Eagle Scout. You've got to, I know how you, you guys plan. I, I, I am a planner and, and I am a goal setter. My goals, I mean, I'm in the first year the first year of my second four-year term. So uh, I, I think that the focus is going to be 100% on this job. There's so much room and opportunity to do big things now. You know, we came in with a billion-dollar deficit five years ago. Now we've got not only a billion-dollar balance in the general fund, our rainy day fund has a billion-dollar balance. We're really in a positive position. My focus is on, on this job, and, uh, and we're going to have a very uh, brutal Michael, in, in 2020, thank, I wake up every morning and thank goodness that my name isn't going to be on a ballot, but I'm going to want to make sure that Arizona is moving good ideas forward in public policy, and if there are bad ideas at the ballot, I want to help stop them. What's your relationship right now with Donald Trump? I know early on it was pretty lukewarm. You did not want to jump in all oars and, you know. 
You kind of, well, I, you I were cautious. Say, as I have a very positive relationship with the president, and I value that. What I did, John, is I stayed out of the primary in, in 2016. I was an incoming freshman. I, I was the new guy. Uh, what I wanted to do was focus on my day job, let the nominee be selected, and then be supportive of the nominee. The nominee was Donald Trump, Trump and I was supportive. Where are you with him now? Oh, I think we have a very positive relationship. Do you think he's a plus for the Martha McSallies of the world and people on the ballot in 2020? I think Arizonans make up their own mind on the candidate whose name is on the ballot. I think Donald Trump has been a plus for our national economy. He's been a plus for our state economy. Uh, I think what's happening in terms of regulation and the rollback has been an incre incredible plus for the U.S. economy. And I think what's happening on the federal bench and the Supreme Court has been a real plus. Let me ask you a bit about um, China <clears throat> and and what's happening in Arizona. Are you getting any trickle down from that, from the from the trade war, quote unquote? Is that hurting some Arizona businesses or, or, or even farmers? I don't think trade wars help business. They don't help the economy. Our economy is booming in Arizona. So the question is how much more would it be booming? I do think the president's trying to right size this trade relationship. You bring it into the 21st century, make sure that we're having fair treatment on our side. And I give him credit for that. Now, my focus is first and foremost on trade with Mexico USM and the MCA. USMCA. We put out together a website, USMCA. Um, do you NAFTA. think it's good for Arizona? Oh, it's good for Arizona, and it's critical for Arizona. Mexico is our number one trade partner. Times four, the USMCA will be even better for Arizona. I can brag on what's happening in the state all day long, 300,000 new jobs, all of the growth. Our relationship with Mexico results in nearly that amount of jobs. There's been discussion, and the president has tried to blunt it by saying this is fake news about a recession, a coming recession. There is some signs that the global economy is slowing down a bit. Do you see anything in Arizona, any signs on our revenues or anything happening where you're a little concerned about 2020? Our, our revenues are growing. We're punching through optimistic uh, budgets. We've got nearly 300 people a day that are moving to our state. We have more people, uh, uh, more jobs available than we have people to fill them. Arizona's paychecks are the third fastest growing in, in, in the country. So I don't see the sign of a recession. Now, here's, here's the facts. A, a recession will someday come. Of course. But to predict it or anticipate it, what you want to do is plan ahead. You and know, that's the rainy hope day for the fund. best, plan, plan for, for the worst. But right now, we are not in recession, and it does, well, we do see blue skies ahead. Okay, let me ask you. Back last month, uh, Charles Ryan, longtime DOC mm. uh, director, resigned. Um, we can roll tape, uh, tape five if you guys would like to in there so people know who Charles Ryan is. Did you ask him to step down? Because there was all of this stuff with the locks in the prisons that were faulty. Uh, we've had some skirmishes in there. People have felt uh, that they're unsafe. Did you I did him? not. I did not ask him. Uh, to retire. Uh, director Ryan is retiring. He served uh, our state and our, Ten our years nation as director. for, for four, 40 years. Uh, and, and I applaud him on his career. We have some issues that we need to deal with in corrections, and we're going to deal with Do you them. think it was time for him to go? Well, that was up to him. Replacement. Replacement is right now we have an You're interim free to replacement. announce it here on Newsmaker Saturday. Uh, it's Joe Perfori, who is the interim, yes. is the interim replacement. And we're doing a national search. I mean, I'm a big believer in leadership and putting the right people in the right places. Corrections is a big job. It's a tough job, and it's a complex job. Um, and we're going to take a look at what and who is available from Could sea to be the shining seas. It, it's possible, but like I said, I want to I, I wanna interview other folks. When I leave the uh, interview here, I'm going to he head back and, and conduct another one. Okay. Uh, let's briefly flip to something. Your father was a cop in Toledo. Yes. Am I right about that? Yes. So I know how you feel about first responders. But I'm curious about these recent battles we've had in Arizona with firefighters claiming occupational cancer and denied workman's compensation. Now, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health casts some doubt on whether there is really a definitive link between firefighting and most of the cancers listed in many states. I don't think anybody would say you should deny benefits to people, but there has to be 
some accountability, right? There's, I mean, listen, with the, every cancer case can't just be linked to firefighting. There should be accountability, but on, in this situation, I, I am not happy about it. I do think action is warranted. And here we are the week of September 11th. We know what these oh, firefighters do. Uh, yeah. They run into the fire. They run up the stairs as other people are coming out. We want to make sure that they have the proper benefits and that these cities aren't hiding behind insurance companies or these insurance companies aren't denying firefighters because there's some loophole in the law. That's what we want to fix. But you understand the concern out there in terms of budgetary um, responsibility because these pensions are under strain, benefits are under strain, People are saying, well, I don't have that kind of protection. I'm, know? I'm very proud of my fiscally responsible credentials. I think I've proven that time and again. But this is also part of, of public policy. Mm -hmm. These are public servants that work on behalf of the citizens of the state. And wherever the fire is, they're headed into it. So I want to make sure there are the proper protections there, like you said, John, with accountability. With accountability. Okay. Discounted tuition for kids who are in Arizona illegally. Um, we found the, the border region said we're, we're not going to give them in state exactly. We're not going to make them pay out of state. We're going to try to strike a balance somewhere in the middle. Do you think they found that balance? What the regents wanted to do was to follow the law and to make sure that the will of the voters was being protected. And they settled on a number that they said was full boat in terms of tuition, mean no subsidization, no, uh, no, no help or benefit from anyone else. And, uh, and I do think and it was for uh, people uh, that, that are here under the status of, of DACA, but it was also for kids that had spent several years in Arizona high schools and then had moved to another state and then wanted to come here for, for college, that they could, they could uh, uh, achieve in-state, uh, not in-state tuition, but uh, a, a different uh, status other than, than out-of-state. When you're trying to find, like for uh, Nicola Motors, qualified people, are these exact kids you want to try to retain if they've graduated? Many of these kids have already spent 12 years inside our school system. Why would we say to them, you have to leave our state to pursue, pursue further ed education or uh, employment opportunities under the law? I think we want them to have the same opportunities that other Arizona high school graduates have. Okay, I've got to ask you about the Nike flap. Mm -hmm. The Betsy Ross sneakers will roll tape number 10. So remind everybody, Nike put these sneakers out. Kaepernick and others complained. They didn't like the American flag and the sneakers because they've got issues with the American flag and, and, and what America's all about. You weighed in and you, um, you said uh, that you were going to withdraw financial incentives for Nike to move to its, its uh, location in Goodyear. That was interesting. Uh, you, it didn't strike me as a Doug Ducey kind of move. My, my statement was uh, in defense of Betsy Ross, in defense of our founding flag. Uh, my issue was with the decision that the company made. Those sneakers were on uh, the, the floor. They were on the shelves inside the stores. They were, they were brought back. I thought that it was uh, uh, ridiculous to say that that flag, our founding flag, was a symbol of anything except the founding of our nation. When you stated that, then it was the day that you signed the deal? With it was the day Nike that the deal uh, that I was made aware that Nike had, had chosen Ar Arizona. And then later you tweeted, good news for Arizona in good year, 500 plus jobs, over 184 million capital investment. Arizona's open for business and we welcome Nike. So Nike and I disagree on, on, on Betsy Ross. We agree that Arizona is the best place in the country in which to do business. I'm not going to boycott my own state. And they had options. They right. chose Arizona. We're always going to be proud, whether it's Trevor Milton or Nike, when they say that's the best place in the nation in which to do business. I just wish they would have sold the shoes, John. Okay. And uh, when you wore the Nikes to the event, was that by design? I'm not a <laughs> cancel culture. I'm not a boycott guy. It wasn't by design. Th those, were, th those were my shoes. And you know, there were a couple hundred people. Th there were a couple hundred people at that barbecue. I normally don't have people waiting in line to talk to me or take pictures. Every one of them was coming up to me saying, I really like what you did on this, and not one of them made a comment on my shoes. Enough said. Governor, good to see Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> good to see you. Governor Doug Ducey, our guest this week on Newsmaker Saturday. We're back in a minute. Thanks, Governor. Appreciate it.